Welcome back. We finally are at the last video in our series on genetics. I know I said part four was going to be the last one, but I ran out of time and didn't get to human genetic disorders. So here we are at part five, human genetic disorders. At the end of part four, we were talking about human genetic conditions caused by non-disjunction, this mechanical mistake during um, meiosis. But in this video, I want to talk more about different types of human genetic disorders. Now, when we study human genetics and disorders in humans, one of the things we like to do is use pedigrees. In other words, we have to look at a family tree or a family history. And the reason we need to do this is because to study human genetics, it takes a long time. The generation time is long. When we study fruit flies, we can get many generations in a short period of time, but you know, humans take a longer time to reproduce and they reproduce in much smaller numbers. So often we'll study family histories and we'll look at these pedigrees. This is called a pedigree here. We can see that uh, circles mean females and the squares are male and if you're shaded in it means you show whatever trait this is tracking and if you're half shaded it means you're a carrier. Uh, this happens to be the pedigree that shows the um, transmittance of hemophilia through the royal families of Europe. You might recognize some names on there down here at the bottom are uh, Prince William and Prince Harry and you can see uh, that their branch of this family tree has seemed to be spared of um, hemophilia. So let's move on. In this video we're going to talk about a couple specific human genetic disorders. Uh, I have a list here and uh, let's start with the first one, sickle cell anemia. Now sickle cell anemia is a genetic blood disorder and it's due to a single point mutation. It's a gene mutation, specifically a base substitution. And it results in red blood cells being misshapen. Normal red blood cells kind of have like this donut shape with the rounded corners and a little depression in the middle. It's like a donut with the hole not quite cut out. But sickle cells are in this sickle shape. And the result is uh, these fragile sickle cells, uh, cells deliver a lot less oxygen to the biased tissues. They can get stuck in the capillaries with these sharp edges and it's very painful. Um, here's a slide that shows real red blood cells. You can see um, the sickle shaped ones. And um, the almost all sufferers of sickle cell anemia have painful episodes called crises which can last from days to hours and they affect the, the bones of the back and the long bones uh, and the chest and again it's extremely painful. Now the sickle cell disease is much more common in people of African and Mediterranean descent. It's also seen in people uh, from South and Central America, the Caribbean and the Middle East. These happen to all be places where malaria has been prevalent. And then we'll talk about that a little more when we do um, our unit on evolution, but there's an interesting reason why that's true. Another interesting thing about sickle cell anemia is that it's a trait that exhibits codominance. So if we were doing genetic crosses with it, we'd build our key and I have RBC or red blood cell shape and we know it comes in two alleles, normal and sickle. And notice the notation I use. I use B for blood cell and normal versus sickle. And we could build a little chart here with the genotypes and phenotypes. So that if you get two normal genes, you have normal red blood cells. And if you get two sickle genes, you have the condition that we call sickle cell anemia. But if you get one normal gene and one sickle gene, you have both normal and sickle cells. And we call that sickle trait. These people seem to do uh, pretty good. They're not sick and they don't have as much painful episodes. Um, and like we said before, um, it happens to be a good defense against malaria. Thus a higher incidence of this sickle allele in areas of the world where malaria is more prevalent. Let's move on to our next disorder, Huntington's disease. Now Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder that's due to a duplication on chromosome number four. It causes certain parts of the brain to degenerate and ultimately it leads to death. Here are some pretty interesting uh, pictures. Here's a brain scan of a patient with Huntington's disease compared to a healthy subject and the dark areas are areas where the, um, the, the neurons have degenerated. And over here is a more stark example where it's a slice of the brain. You can see there's all just less brain tissue in a, um, this is a pretty advanced Huntington's patient. And eventually it, uh, it leads to death. So, an interesting thought here. Huntington's disease is unique because it's caused by a dominant gene. Now, why is that unique? Uh, dominant genes uh, don't have to be common. In fact, Huntington's is fairly rare, but it's dominant, which means it's expressed. But again, why is that interesting? Well, 
here's a hint. Leading to death and dominant? If a gene's dominant and you have it, it gets expressed. And in this case, if it gets expressed, you're going to die. Well, how do you then pass the gene on? Think about it. Dominant lethal genes tend to remove themselves from the gene pool. If you have a gene that kills you, it's hard to pass that gene on. But how has Huntington's disease not eliminated itself from the gene pool? Well, it turns out that Huntington's disease does not become symptomatic until around age 40. So you've had a lot of time in your reproductive years to have passed this gene on. Let's move on to our next one. Hemophilia. Hemophilia is a blood clotting disorder. Sorry about the picture there if you're a little squeamish. But it happens to be due to a recessive gene on the X chromosome. It's a sex-linked recessive trait. Again, here's our karyotype, I'm sorry, our pedigree from the very first slide in this video. And uh, it's showing the movement of hemophilia through the royal families of Europe. Since this is a sex-linked recessive trait, we can look at how we do a uh, genetic problem with it. It's the, the trait's blood clotting, and we have the normal gene, which is dominant over the hemophilia gene, which is recessive, but it's sex-linked, so we put it on an X chromosome. So if we look at the possible genotypes for females, you could have a female that carries two normal genes. Whoops, that's uh, not correct. I got these backwards. Hold on one second. There we go. If you have two normal genes, then you're a normal female. If you're carrying one of the hemophilia genes and you're a female and one normal gene, then we say that you're a carrier, but you're not affected because hemophilia is recessive. The only way for a female to, be, to express hemophilia is to carry two of the hemophilia genes. But what about the men's side of things? On the male side of things, and again, I have these backwards. Hold on. There we go. If you get a normal gene, you're a normal male. If you get the hemophilia gene, you're hemophiliac. Notice there's no way to be a carrier because males only receive one copy of this sex-linked gene. We talked about sex-linked genes and sex-linked traits in earlier videos, and we've done some of those problems, so we can move on. How about this one? Polydactylism. This is a genetic disorder due to an autosomal dominant gene. What does it mean? Let's look at the word. Poly means many. What about dactyl or dactyly? Let me give you a hint. You got it figured out yet? How about a bigger hint? Polydactylism means many digits. So when you have extra fingers or toes. It's not very common, but it is caused by a dominant gene. Let's move on. How about PKU or phenylcanaturia? Phenylcanaturia is a genetic metabolic disorder. It's due to a rare but recessive autosomal gene, and it can result in the failure of making, to make an enzyme. And that enzyme breaks down phenylalanine, which is an amino acid. And if you don't break down phenylalanine, it can lead to brain damage. Now, phenylalanine is an amino acid found in lots of foods. You can see on this side lots of protein-rich foods. It's not found so much over here. So the treatment of phenylalanine, or PKU, is to follow a very strict diet. Um, and furthermore, not just um, having PKU fall in this diet, but we can detect this prior to birth through chorionic villus sampling. Basically, they take a tissue sample from the chorion of the developing embryo, and we can detect the presence of this disorder. And then the mother, the pregnant mother, uh, starts a very restrictive diet so that the, the baby, um, even before they're born, doesn't start to build up these um, harmful chemicals in their brain that can cause damage even prior to birth. And finally, Tay-Sachs disease. Tay-Sachs, like PKU, is a metabolic disorder due to a rare recessive autosomal gene and the failure to make an enzyme that leads to a buildup of toxins in the brain that leads to brain damage. About one in every 27 members, however, of a very specific group, Ashkenazi Jewish population, uh, carries this gene. So in some sections of the population, this is a much more common uh, gene. So there we have just a sampling of different types of genetic disorders in humans. Uh, one that shows codominance, one that's lethal and dominant, a couple of metabolic disorders, uh, a sex-linked disorder, and you know, just a 
a weird one that we'd like to look at, polydactylism. And that uh, brings an end to our, our, our discussion on genetics and this final discussion on human genetics and human genetic disorders. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments section below the video, and I hope you learned something.